morning, everybody. My name is Celia, and I'm a singer-songwriter, and I wrote this song after I learned a lot about GMO foods. And recently, I recorded it, and we made a video with some local musicians, including Jonathan Best and some other wonderful singers. And you can see it online. You're not going to be able to hear the guitar as much, but this is about our right to know what is in our food. Listen, brother, listen, sister, it could kill you or enrich you. Read the label, read the label, then read behind the lines. To the doctor, to the clinic, you may say that I'm a cynic as you pick up your prescription and you're feeling fine. Till next time, I've got the right to choose. You've got the right to choose. We've got the right to choose. Feed the family, feed the children, we're a culture that's been ill and what has got into our bodies and our precious minds. Plant a garden, plant a garden, build your soil, get started and save grandmother's seeds cause we are running out of time. I've got the right to choose, you've got the right to choose, we've got the right to choose. How could it?
come sign up and yeah, talk to you over there. <laughs> is also catering an event on campus tonight, so she'll be coming in a little late, but there is an official Slow Food chapter in Prescott, um, and you can find them online, just Google Slow Food Prescott, um, and did you want to say a couple words about, do you have one? Yeah. So I'm representing for GMO Free Prescott tonight, and Shay, who is our president, couldn't be here. She asked me to say a few things. Obviously, I'm Celia, and I'm part of the group. And we are committed to raising awareness about GMO foods in our food supply. We have a couple of more events for the October being non-GMO month. Tomorrow night, there's a lecture and film at the library, which is called What Parents Need to Know About GMOs. And then there's a GMO-free dinner. It's the third one that's happening at New Frontiers Saturday evening. Definitely get a reservation because it sells out really fast. And then on Saturday morning at One Root, who's sponsored with the tea, there's this talk at 9 a.m. about the associated health risks of GMO foods. We have handouts that are free. We have some other things that you can purchase. And if you'd like to be on the mailing list and be apprised of what's going on with the GMO free movement here in town, please do that over there. We're on Facebook, we're online. Join us, thank you. manager of our Prescott Farmers Market, which uh, unfortunately this Saturday is our last day, so make sure you all come down. We're having customer appreciation day. There'll be plenty of cool pumpkin pie, pumpkin pumpkins. And um, I hear a rumor that Whipstone Farm will be having a farm stand for a few Saturdays after that. Okay, so check them out in the Batterman's parking lot um, after the Farmers Market is over this weekend. Um, and then I'm also the coordinator of our Prescott College CSA. Uh, so that's another great place to get your veggies throughout the winter, just in case you all don't know about it. And I apologize because I didn't end up with any people over there, but um, you can track me down here on campus. And yeah, that's it. Thank you.
with this crowd, Sandra Katz needs very minimal introduction. How many of you um, have been enjoying Sandra Katz's fermentation world previous to tonight? Awesome. So Sandra is originally from New York. Uh, he went to Brown University. He has spent almost the last 20 years um, in an intentional community in rural Tennessee, um, and he's now living a couple houses down from the intentional community in rural Tennessee. Um, he is pretty much a walking compendium of all this cultural tradition and knowledge about how we make and eat and enjoy fermented foods. But really the most amazing thing about Sandor is that he feels compelled to share all of this amazing knowledge and excitement and enthusiasm with everybody. So um, thank you so much, Sandor, for being you. <laughs> and thanks for being here in Prescott, Arizona. And um, I'm very excited to introduce Sandor Katz. <laughs> Question: What is fermentation anyway, uh, and why is it significant? Louder. Louder. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so broadly speaking, fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Now, you know, any of you with a biology biology background might already be shaking your heads. Uh, biologists definitely work with a, a, a more specific definition of fermentation that has to do with um, anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy uh, without oxygen, and certainly the, um, uh, you know, many of the classic ferments, you know, alcoholic beverages that people like to uh, drink, uh, yogurt, sauerkraut, uh, you know, these are all uh, uh, products of anaerobic processes. Um, but there also are some ferments that require oxygen, things like kombucha, vinegar, tempeh. So, and, and, and these are really universally regarded as fermented foods and beverages also. So I prefer to work with a, a broader, kind of lay definition of fermentation as the transformative action of microorganisms. However, we all know that not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we think is appropriate to use for that. Um, and in fact, the transformative action of microorganisms is what you know, results in much of uh, what we would call food spoilage, rotten food, spoiled food, what we throw into the compost, what we send to the landfill. Um, so, so there's sort of a, like an aspect of intentionality to fermentation. Um, you know, it, it, it's the transformative action of microorganisms, but generally that has been guided in some way. Like really what the, what, what the art and practice of fermentation amounts to um, is simple manipulations of environmental conditions to encourage the growth of certain kinds of organisms while discouraging the growth of other types of organisms. Um, and there's a certain inevitability to fermentation because Everything that we would ever think of to eat, um, you know, all plant products, all animal products, are covered with microorganisms. So one way or another, the microorganisms will transform the foods. And so, you know, centuries, millennia before anyone was able to um, uh, see microorganisms, able to identify specific microorganisms, um, you know, cultures all around the world observed how food stored under different kinds of conditions aged differently and developed techniques to guide fermentation um, so that the products of fermentation would be more delicious, more stable, more digestible, rather than rotten. 
and, uh, and, and, and simply unappealing. So because there's this inevitability to fermentation, fermentation is widespread. I mean, I definitely do not know about every culinary tradition that exists on this earth, but I've been looking really hard for almost 20 years for a counterexample, and I can't find any examples of culinary traditions that do not incorporate some uh, form of fermentation or another. Um, and I'll bet that almost everyone in this room has already eaten or, uh, or, or drunk some, uh, some, something fermented in the course of this day. So let, let's just do it by, by, by raising hands. Okay, so, so let's start with bread. I'll bet that bread is a very widespread thing. How many people here have had some bread today? Okay, so right there, we have like almost half of the, half of the people here. How many people here started their day with a cup of coffee? Okay, so there's, a, there's another one that's about half the people here. How about um, some cheese? Has anyone had some cheese over the course of this day? Um, what about any kind of a cured meat? Any like, you know, salami or ham or any, any kind of a cured meat? Okay, we have a, a smaller crowd for that. That's a, a, a significant sample. Um, uh, yogurt. Uh, sauerkraut or kimchi or sour pickles or anything like that. Um, how about condiments? Everyone loves condiments in their food, and not, not all condiments are produced directly by fermentation. Certain of them are. Uh, soy sauce, fish sauce are directly fermented. But uh, you know, if you had uh, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, hot sauce, um, uh, you know, or any one of a number of other types of condiments, these are uh, these are stabilized by vinegar, which is a product of fermentation. Anyone have any of those things or salad dressing? Okay, so um, so so you know, a lot of very basic uh, everyday foods are products of fermentation. Um, now, even though almost everyone eats products of fermentation, they, oh, and I, you know, I almost forgot, beer, wine, <laughs> or maybe, maybe that's after the talk. Um, so, so, so almost everyone eats fermented foods almost every day, and yet, you know, partly because um, you know, food production has largely, you know, disappeared from the fabric of our communities, uh, you know, to, to, to far away factories that we don't get to see. And partly as a result of the fact that, um, you know, we all are living in the midst of what I call the war on bacteria. And we have been, you know, indoctrinated to, to, to be terrified of bacteria and, uh, you know, and basically believe that the world would be a safer place for us if we could somehow eradicate all bacteria. Um, you know, most of us have never practiced any fermentation in our lives, and we, and we approach the idea of it with fear. I mean, I would say the number one question that I have, uh, you know, that I have fielded in, um, you know, uh, coming on 20 years of fermentation education that I've been involved in is, how can I be sure that I'm getting good bacteria growing rather than bad bacteria? Um, how can I be sure that I'm not going to accidentally make someone sick or even kill someone? And this is a paralyzing fear for people. Um, um, you know, uh, um, you know, we, we really have been indoctrinated to fear bacteria. And so, you know, most of what I, what I feel like I do is reassure people. Um, you know, these are ancient rituals that people have been doing forever. Um, and, uh, and they are strategies for safety as much as they are strategies for, uh, for, for anything else. And, you know, taking a food like sauerkraut, according to the USDA, there never has been a case of food poisoning reported in the United States from fermented vegetables. Mm -hmm. Now, there are not many foods you could say that about, and you certainly couldn't say that about raw vegetables, because we hear every year about, uh, you know, these kind of scandalous outbreaks of people in you know 38 states getting sick from you know lettuce, um, uh, spinach, tomatoes. Uh, this year was cantaloupes. Um, you know, it's sort of one thing after another. So there always is the possibility of incidental contamination. Usually, it's manure from a factory farm, you know, uphill somewhere, running down over the vegetables. It could be handling, you know, um, um, you know, incidental contamination can happen from, you know, things on the hands uh, or bacteria on the hands of people handling it. But if you took vegetables that had been exposed to some sort of incidental contamination, and you chopped them up and salted them and got them nice and juicy and got them submerged under their own juices, which is the technique for making sauerkraut, 
But what happened is that the indigenous population of lactic acid bacteria that's present on all raw vegetables and all raw plant material would wildly outnumber whatever kind of incidental contaminants were there, and as they acidified the environment, they would simply make it disappear. Um, so, you know, so, so, so saying that, that, that fermented vegetables are intrinsically safe is not to deny that vegetables could be exposed to, uh, you know, types of bacteria that would make us sick. It's just that that incidental exposure can never compete with the dense populations of lactic acid bacteria that are always there. Um, you know, this idea that, 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 all, uh, that, that all food is covered with microorganisms, um, you know, the reality that, that, that I think we're just beginning to face is that, you know, all life is evolved from bacteria. And the corollary to that, which doesn't get talked about as much, is that no form of life has ever lived without bacteria. Um, and so it's pretty reliable that the, that the, you know, that the vegetables and the fruits that we eat are covered with very predictable um, populations of microorganisms, just as our bodies are populated by very predictable populations of microorganisms. And there, there, there's, been a, there's been a lot of new information lately about the communities of microorganisms that are living in our bodies. Actually, it turns out that the, that the cells of our bodies, the cells that reflect our, our, our own unique individual DNA codes, are outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria that we are host to. Or perhaps a more accurate way of stating it would be bacteria that are host to us. And that, you know, really we are these like bacterial superstructures. <laughs> And you know these, these bacteria are not you know they're not parasitic they're not um, you know they're they're not just like taking from us and not giving us anything I mean it's really it's it's becoming increasingly clear that many aspects of our functionality um, are related to the bacteria uh, uh, that that are that are part of us you know human beings could not reproduce without bacteria. Um, human beings could not digest food effectively without bacteria. We couldn't assimilate the nutrients in the food without bacteria. Bacteria, uh, bacteria synthesize certain essential uh, uh, nutrients for us. Um, it's becoming increasingly clear that, that what we call our immune function is largely mediated by bacteria in our gut, even when that response is in other parts of our bodies. Um, the, you know, the latest revelations are that our, our, our brain chemistry, the release of serotonin and, and other um, uh, 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 you know, compounds that determine you know, how we feel and how we think um, are, are actually mediated by bacteria. So you know, all of these aspects of our functionality are, are dependent upon bacteria. You know, and yet we continue to get this message that you know bacteria are bad. We should try to kill bacteria. Our lives would be better if we could wipe them out. And I think the most vivid uh, reflection of this is the widespread use of these antibacterial cleansing products. I mean, is there anything sexier that a, a marketer could write on a container of soap than that it kills 99.9% of bacteria? And, um, you know, and, and then, you know, most of us respond to that. Like, okay, you know, let's, let, let's get that one, the one that kills all the bacteria. But, you know, in fact, there's nothing desirable about killing 99.9% of bacteria because 99.9% .9 of bacteria are what protect us from 0.1% of bacteria. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this, this, this is like, you know, this is an ideology that, uh, you know, that's very misguided, but I, but I, I call it the war on bacteria. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that we really have to, um, uh, you know, shake ourselves free of this kind of uh, thinking and, um, you know, and learn how to embrace bacteria. And, um, you know, one way we can do that is by embracing bacterially rich foods, you know, which, as we've just demonstrated, are, are, are you know, many of the most, uh, you know, not only the most common foods, but, you know, the, 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 the most delicious foods. <laughs>
<laughs> and, and really, you know, fermentation creates strong flavors. Uh, you know, if you walk through a gourmet food store and start thinking about the nature of the foods that we elevate on this pedestal, and uh, you know, and, and regard as gourmet foods, almost all of them are produced by, by, by fermentation. And fermentation creates strong flavors. You know, they are not always universally loved flavors. Uh, a lot of the flavors of, of fermentation actually are, are, are somewhat controversial. Um, you know, even sauerkraut. Not everybody likes sauerkraut. It might shock you, but um, uh, you know, when, when, when wild fermentation first came out, I, I did this cross-country uh, sauerkraut road show. And I, I, would stand, I would stand in health food stores and offer people tastes of sauerkraut while I did a little sauerkraut making demonstration and tried to get people to talk about fermentation. And you know, everybody loves free tastes of food, right? You, know, you see someone handing out uh, uh, free tastes from across the food, uh, across the store, and you, you walk towards it. To see what they're going to offer you. And uh, I don't know what you're imagining it's going to be, but I, I started to wish that I had a hidden camera because, you know, so often as, as people approached and realized that I was offering them sauerkraut, they'd make some, you know, contorted face. Like, oh. um, and, and I think certainly in the realm of, of cheese, we, we all can relate to, you know, the idea that, you know, not everybody loves every flavor of fermentation. So let's, let's do a poll here. Who here can identify with the statement, I love stinky, stinky cheeses that I can smell from 100 feet away? Okay. And how many people here would say, I'm scared of cheeses like that, and they, they remind me of death, and I would like to think about putting them in my mouth? You know? Okay, so, so a few people. Um, so, so, you know, not everybody loves every flavor of fermentation. Um, you know, around the world, you know, people, people uh, uh, eat many, many fermented foods, you know, some of which are, are absolute survival practices uh, in different regions of the world, that people who, you know, are not accustomed to these foods, people who haven't been acculturated to these flavors, um, have a hard time, um, uh, uh, you know, tolerating or, or even imagining putting into their mouths. So, so you know, fermentation creates strong flavors, and this is, you know, both you know one of the things we love about it, and one of the things that that, that, that sometimes people find, um, you know, scary and, and challenging about them. Um, uh, you know, fermentation preserves food. That, I mean, this has been a hugely important reason why people ferment food. I mean, you know, sauerkraut is a, is a strategy for, you know, preserving vegetables from the harvest season to feed people through the seasons where there aren't fresh vegetables coming out of the garden. Uh, you know, cheddar cheese and other kinds of hard cheeses are strategies for extending the useful life of milk. Uh, you know, salamis and other kinds of cured meats are strategies for, you know, taking this, you know, very perishable, um, uh, uh, you know, product and, uh, and turning it into something that people can eat for a longer period of time. You know, from within our perspective in the historical bubble of refrigeration, I'm going to guess everybody in this room uh, lives with a fermentation slowing device. Am I right? Are there, are there, are there, are there, any, people, are there any people in this room who live without refrigeration? Okay, uh, one person. Okay, so that, that's a that's a you know, there, there are definitely people, you know, on the fringes of American life, you know, uh, sometimes by choice and sometimes by virtue of poverty, who don't have a refrigerator in their home. Um, but, but it has become the norm. And so, you know, our perspective on, on, on food and food perishability is determined by that. But let, like, think about, a, think about something like milk. You know, fresh milk is really a phenomenon of the 20th century. Throughout history, uh, the people milking goats and cows have been able to have fresh milk, but everyone else has enjoyed soured milk, and that's, you know, yogurt, kefir, and the, you know, hundreds, probably thousands of, you know, other, um, um, you know, uh, uh, styles of fermented milk. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're soured milk. I mean, they're, they're basically ways that people could enjoy uh, their milk prior to the widespread advent of refrigeration. Um, now, I mean, I think many people, you know, just assume that, you know, we all always will have refrigerators. Um, but, you know, sort of, uh, you know, give, give, given the concerns about, you know, peak oil and, um, and, and, and concerns about, you know, what's the, what's the price of energy going to be uh, in the future? What's the availability of energy going to be? 
you know, I don't know that we can really safely assume that everybody is always going to be able to have a refrigerator. And literally, if we take a more global perspective, I mean, most people on this earth do not have a refrigerator in their home. Um, and so, you know, the 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 uh, you know the wisdom of our ancestors that you know people people figured out how to safely and effectively preserve food without refrigeration, and you know we really cannot afford to um, you know to lose that wisdom. You know this is you know this is you know as important a cultural legacy as you know as the seeds that we have uh, you know inherited from from our ancestors and which which give us our, our, our food. And I would go so far as to say that agriculture wouldn't make sense without fermentation. I mean, if you want to be a hunter-gatherer and spend every day procuring the food resources to get you through the day, well then fine, you don't really have to think about um, uh, you know, storage of food and, and, and how food stores under different conditions. But um, you know, once you start investing your energy into crops that are ready at a certain moment of the year, you need to have some insight into uh, you know, how food is going to age. And um, uh, you know, canning is one way of preserving food. Um, you know, we might tend to think of that as an old-timey method of food preservation. Um, but, you know, in fact, I mean, canning was invented in the 1800s in, in, in France. And in France, they call it apertization because they remember the name of Nicolas Apert, the fellow who invented the process. Um, and canning is kind of the diametrical opposite of fermentation in terms of food preservation because canning is based on basically sterilizing food, making sure that the microorganisms on the food are dead. Um, so that the food will, will be able to be preserved. Fermentation, uh, uh, what we're doing is cultivating the growth of acidifying organization, uh, organizations, uh, acidifying um, organisms um, uh, uh, to, to stabilize the food. And, and generally, you know, a canned food you could put into, you know, a, a storm cellar, uh, you know, and, and, and have it be there for Armageddon, even if Armageddon doesn't come for another 20 years. Fermented foods tend to be a little bit more dynamic, um, tend to not last for quite as long, tend to require a little bit more ongoing um, um, uh, 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 involvement. Um, uh, but they preserve food with the nutrients much more intact and even enhanced. Um, fermentation uh, transforms the, the, the nutrients in food in a number of ways, and actually nutrition is the reason why many people are, are becoming interested in fermentation. Uh, fermentation is a form of pre-digestion, especially for uh, you know, dense, compound, difficult to digest nutrients. Fermentation you know, basically breaks them down into more elemental forms and, and, and makes those nutrients more bioavailable. Uh, fermentation enhances certain nutrients. B vitamins tend to be elevated. Um, uh, you know, various unique micronutrients that are me metabolic byproducts of, uh, of different organisms growing in different foods develop in them. Um, you know, some of them actually have uh, uh, some very um, um, uh, promising uh, medicinal applications. Um, uh, fermentation is, is used for detoxifying foods, and, and in this sense, it's really critical. You know, for instance, um, uh, cassava grown in African soils has high levels of cyanide and would be really poisonous to people if it weren't processed, and the way that it's processed to remove the cyanide is through fermentation. And the fermentation basically pre-digests the cyanide into, uh, uh, into um, uh, 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 component, um, uh, uh, um, uh, more elemental forms that, that are benign, and, and, it, and it renders the, the, um, the cassava uh, edible, and lots of less, dr less dramatic uh, food toxins can be removed by fermentation. And then there's the live cultures themselves. Um, you, know, uh, um, you know, throughout history, nobody really had to think twice about, you know, replenishing uh, uh, you know, bacteria uh, into their uh, uh, intestines. Um, I mean, people didn't know about them to, to think about them. Um, but in the context of this war on bacteria, you know, we all are exposed to chemical compounds every day that are assaulting the bacteria in our gut. Um, you know, antibiotic drugs that um, you know, individuals may take for very important life-saving reasons, but everybody agrees they're wildly overprescribed, and more so than in human populations, animals are just pumped 
built up with, with you know, huge amounts of antibiotics. So there's a residue of antibiotics in a lot of the meat and the milk that we eat, and it's accumulating in our water tables. So you know, we all are ingesting antibiotic compounds every single day. There's chlorine in the water, there's the antibacterial cleansing products. So, uh, so you know, we just have multiple chemical exposures to, uh, you know, to, to compounds that, that kill bacteria. Um, and, uh, you know, many of the emerging uh, 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 public health crises, um, you know, some of the theories about, about why they are arising has to do with populations of bacteria in our gut that are being destroyed. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, uh, foods rich in lactic acid bacteria have very stimulating effect on us. Um, and, uh, and, and in certain ways can, uh, you know, can replenish and diversify um, you know, the, the bacteria or maybe really it's the genetics available to the bacteria uh, in our gut. Uh, you know, really we only have the crudest understanding of you know, what the mechanisms are. Um, but there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of exciting evidence that bacterial stimulation can help people maintain uh, good health. Um, a lot of the evidence is about, uh, you know, uh, uh, little capsules, uh, what we call probiotics, um, which are which are usually proprietary strains. You know, most of the clinical trials that are done are done with proprietary strains. I mean, who is going to pay for uh, clinical trials for sauerkraut? Um, but you know, just yesterday, I, I get the I get this like digest of this uh, you know Daily Science magazine, Science Daily, and they they had a they had a um, they had an article about um, uh, college students and probiotics. That the college students who are taking probiotics get fewer colds than college students who don't take probiotics. And when they do get colds, they are less severe and they last for less time. So there's always the question, you know, people in the probiotics industry would say, well, you have to buy our little pills. Like, you know, there's no way that, you know, traditional foods with, uh, you know, the bacteria that grow on the foods could have the same effect. Um, and, you know, and, and there really is, is, is no way to be sure. But there is a little bit of evidence, you know, suggesting that, that actually eating a diversity of traditional foods that are bacterially rich um, have an even greater um, uh, you know, probiotic stimulating effect than, you know, individual uh, uh, super strains of bacteria packaged in, uh, in capsules. So this, uh, these, these Spanish investigators got a group of volunteers who were um, fermented foods enthusiasts, people who ate uh, uh, cheeses and salamis and yogurt and olives and other kinds of bacterially rich foods. And they did some, uh, some baseline blood work, and they were looking at immune globulin and a couple of other markers of immune functioning. Um, and they got baseline levels. Then they put everyone on a deprivation diet, and I don't know how they survived four weeks without any of their favorite fermented foods. But then at the end of the four weeks, they did some more blood work. And they, they looked at the same indicators, and everybody's immune globulin and other immune markers were suppressed uh, as a result of not having that bacterial stimulation. And then they put half the people on yogurt, traditional yogurt, and half the people on one of these sort of new improved probiotic yogurts, you know, the Spanish equivalent of Dan and Zactivia. Um, and what they found is that both groups regained approximately the same levels of their immune markers, but nobody regained their full levels that they started with until they were allowed to um, you know, start eating their varied diets rich in a variety of different kinds of fermented foods. Um, so anyway, I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I feel good when I eat fermented foods. Um, you know, I think that there, there's a certain amount of, uh, there's a certain amount of hype. I mean, there's people marketing kombucha, telling people that, you know, kombucha will cure your diabetes. Uh, you know, kombucha will cure cancer. And um, you know, I feel very skeptical of these of these miracle claims. But I do think that for uh, you know, for, for any of us, you know, whether whether we are you know, strapping nineteen year olds, you know, at, at at the healthiest we'll ever be, or whether you know we're living with some you know horrible health crisis or a chronic disease that we've been living with for years, or just feeling the effects of aging, you know, simply by enabling us to digest food more effectively, assimilate nutrients better, improve overall immune functioning, um, 
you know, it has the potential to make us, uh, to, to, to improve our health, and, uh, and, and certainly not to, uh, to, to hurt us in any way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about, about culture. And, uh, you know, when we make something like yogurt, we have to transfer, we have to use a little bit of yogurt to start the next batch of yogurt. We call, we call the community of, um, of organisms that makes the yogurt, we call those cultures. We call the act of transferring it from one batch to the next, culturing. Um, uh, certain cultures actually have evolved into physical forms. Somebody today, actually back there, you can see it. There's, there's a kombucha mother. Kombucha is an example of a, uh, of a culture that has evolved into a physical form. Uh, it's this sort of, you know, uh, rubbery, flat pancake kind of thing that, that floats on top of the sweet tea. And, uh, and, and that is the embodiment of a community of bacteria uh, and fungi. Um, uh, uh, when cultures evolve into a physical form like that, they're, they're, they're known as SCOBYs, S-C-O-V-Y, which is a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. Um, uh, kefir is another famous scoby, that's a milk culture, and, 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 and kefir uh, grains or curds look like little florets of cauliflower. Um, they're, they're, they're these little rubbery blobs that are, that are white and, uh, and, uh, and they grow uh, as, as, as they're fed milk. Um, and, and, and these are all called cultures. Um, I'd like to draw people's attention to the sort of odd fact that we use the same word to describe, um, you know, these little communities of microorganisms that we use to turn milk into yogurt, etc., that we use to describe, you know, our language, music, literature, scientific understanding, belief systems, religious practices, and really the totality of all things that we seek to pass down from generation to generation. And I would just, you know, sort of suggest to you that as a group, fermented foods are, you know, more than incidental culinary novelties. You know, they're not like cupcakes. Um, and, and that they really are, you know, they're, they're, they're central, you know, not only to culinary traditions all around the world, but also to people's sense of cultural identity. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you hear people's migration stories, you know, when people have had um, the opportunity to bring their most precious possessions with them when they cross the ocean, they bring their food cultures with them. They bring their sourdoughs. They bring their yogurt cultures. Um, and, and, and they're very strongly identified with them. Um, I, have a, I have a friend in California, Betty Steckmeyer, and she started a company called Gem Cultures, and she ran this for about 35 years, and, and now she's, passed the, she's retired and passed it to her daughter. But she told me this beautiful story about her, uh, her husband's uncle, uh, who had uh, come to this country from Finland uh, as a young boy with his family, and they brought with them a Finnish milk culture called Vili. Uh, which, uh, which Betty's daughter still, still sells, and it's a, it's a really fun milk culture uh, that makes a really weird texture. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but Betty, Betty tells the story where um, she found herself taking care of her husband's uncle at the end of his life. Uh, he, was about, uh, he was about 96 years old. And, um, and one day, he sat up and he, he, he called Betty into the room with some urgency. And his, his name for, for Vili was The Seed. Uh, and he said, he said uh, 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 you know how to take care of The Seed. And you know, Betty had been propagating this and selling it to people for 35 years and was very, very familiar with it. So she assured him, she was like, yes, Van, I know how to take care of it. I'm very committed to it. Uh, I've been spreading it around to lots of other people. Uh, the Seed is secure. And then the next time she walked into the room, he had died. Um, and that was his parting concern. You know, that was the reassurance that he needed to be able to let go. You know, and, 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 and so the, the significance of this culture, of uh, this food culture, was that it was the embodiment of this culture that he had left behind and that he had brought with him, and he wanted her reassurance that it was going to sort of uh, live on beyond him and, uh, and, 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 and have a, a continuity. 
Um, so, so uh, you know, I think that the, the story you know, sort of illustrates a little bit, uh, you know, just how centrally important these cultured foods can be to people's sense of cultural identity. Um, I just also wanted to talk for a second about community. Um, microorganisms are never singular. I mean, we can walk into any uh, supermarket and we can buy a packet of yeast. That would be an example of a singular microorganism, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, in the natural world, you never find yeast alone. Yeast exists in communities with other microorganisms. The idea of singular microorganisms is very much a you know, human technological contrivance. Um, and all of the traditional ferments work with communities of organisms. And sometimes these communities have evolved into distinctive physical forms, as with the kombucha and the kefir and, uh, and, and, and several other uh, similar examples. Um, but really, you know, the way that microbiology has sought to um, improve upon fermentation um, is to isolate you know, as few bacteria as possible that, that, that will functionally make the food work and get rid of all the others that are deemed to be um, extraneous. And so, um, you know, yogurt cultures, okay? So, so, so traditional yogurt cultures, and yogurt is this word that we use to describe, you know, fermented milk products from lots of different parts of the world that aren't necessarily all the same. Um, but, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, some of the, the early microbiologists looking at, at fermentation looked at the Bulgarian uh, milk cultures, uh, uh, yogurt cultures, and they basically identified two organisms out of that as being the, uh, the active principle, what really defines yogurt. So in U.S. law, internationally through the Codex Alimentarius, yogurt is defined as two bacteria, um, uh, Lactobacillus vulgaricus, and uh, Streptococcus thermophilus, and you never see that one spelled out on the yogurt container. Um, uh, but traditional yogurts always involved a broader community that evolved, and they evolved with a community structure and sort of community defense mechanisms that enabled them to maintain over the course of multiple generations. Um, so how many people here have tried making yogurt? Okay, so you go to the store, you buy some whole, some, some, some plain whole milk yogurt, and you make yogurt out of it. Your first batch, if you get the temperature manipulation right, is gonna be great and nice and firm. And then your second batch, maybe it'll be okay. Your third batch, it's never gonna be quite as thick as what you started with. And after four or five generations, it's not recognizable as yogurt. Has anyone here ever had an experience like that where their, their yogurt started really petered out? So this is because microbiologists sought to improve upon the traditional cultures and, and exclude everything that they didn't perceive to be, um, um, you know, sort of specifically functional. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I have to assume that for mass producers, there's some benefit in using these, um, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, isolated cultures um, rather than the uh, traditional communities. But for people trying to practice it at home, it is simply disempowering because we have to keep on going back to the store every couple of batches of yogurt and buying more starter. Um, so finally, a couple of years ago, I got a hold of an heirloom yogurt uh, culture. And I've made about 50 generations, and every batch is just as beautiful and thick as the batch before. Um, and it's really extraordinary. And really, the same story could be told about lots of different ferments. Um, uh, you know, in order for these foods to have been passed down to us, they had to have had some ability to, to be stable, to be passed down through the generations. Um, but uh, you know, in the name of improvement, um, you know, uh, largely the cultures that are easily available to us are you know, no longer self-reproducing. And I think that this is almost exactly analogous to what's happened with seeds, where you know, in the name of, of you know, improved yields, you know, uh, farmers and gardeners were seduced into you know, largely abandoning the traditional seeds that they worked with that were well adapted to specific local conditions and bought into the idea of, of improved 
uh, uh, yields, but then it turned out that the yields are only approved if the conditions are perfect. So everyone had to put in irrigation, and people started using uh, uh, you know chemicals to to deal with the the, the pests that the that the new improved varieties were um, were were, were uh, um, uh, um, uh, prone to, um, and people could not save the seeds because, you know, the hybrids need, you know, uh, they, they need two specific lines. It takes, a, you know, a certain amount of technical skill to be able to effectively cross the two lines. And so it has bred dependence on seed companies, on chemical companies, uh, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, I think that these, I think these processes are, you know, are very much um, um, parallel processes. Um, Finally, I, I want to just say, and, and I'm, I'm really trying to keep this short because I'm much more interested in having uh, interaction with you all and answering questions and hearing what you all have to say. Um, but I want to I want to talk about just some other connotations of the word fermentation. Um, so you know, we, we we read in the newspapers, we hear we you know we 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 hear on TV and on the radio uh, sometimes about um, cultural ferment or political ferment or social ferment or I've even seen uh, references to uh, intellectual ferment or spiritual ferment. <laughs> now the word fermentation comes from Latin fervere, which means to boil. And it's because the visible action of fermentation is bubbles, at least in liquids, it's bubbles, just as the visible action of boiling is bubbles. And actually the word yeast comes from Greek zestos, which also means boiling. Um, so, so, you know, really, like, and until, until Louis Pasteur began to identify fermentation organisms under a microscope, you know, what people always understood fermentation to mean was the bubbling, the visible action of fermentation. Now, when people get excited, they get kind of bubbly themselves, <laughs> ourselves. Um, so, you know, especially when people, when, when, when people begin to believe that, you know, change is possible, change is on the horizon, change is, you know, they're on the verge of change, people get excited about that. You know, they, they want to share their excitement with people. Um, uh, you know, they, they want to talk about it. It's irrepressible. And, and, and that's where we get this sort of metaphorical understanding of fermentation. It's because people can get bubbly also. Um, so, uh, so, you know, just, just, just to sort of close, I, I want to, uh, you know, the, the fact that so many of us never get exposed to fermentation or to the practice of fermentation, you know, is because food production has largely disappeared from our communities. You know, every, every other kind of organism on this earth you know, has to be um, uh, you know, constantly interacting with its environment uh, in order to nourish itself. And uh, you know, this has historically been true of human beings as well. And uh, you know, in some ways, we've been liberated by not all having to be you know, sort of constantly occupied with, um, with feeding ourselves. But that's also come at a cost. And I think you know, during the period of time when, uh, you know, when, when, when I was growing up, um, you know, I, I think people accepted that, that they had been liberated from food production. You know, like there were no farmers markets. Um, um, you know, I mean, the food came from the supermarket and it came from wherever it came from. Uh, and people weren't thinking about that. But I, I think that, you know, people are waking up to the fact that, uh, you know, the mass production of food is not, you know, all liberation for us. You know, it's, 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 it's resulting in, you know, uh, incredible environmental devastation, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the um, overuse of, uh, of essential resources like water, um, it's producing food that is uh, really nutritionally diminished and, 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 and resulting in uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, enormous health problems. It's you know, sort of undermining the, um, uh, the, the fabric of our, uh, of our you know, sort of economic security. So you know, for all these reasons, I think you know, people are realizing that we have to reclaim our food, that you know, centralized uh, you know, mass production far in faraway places you know, is not all good. We have, we have to take food production back. And so, you know, part of that, um, you know, an essential part of that is, is fermentation. I mean, you know, local food can't just be raw fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, that's not really what people eat on a daily basis. People, people eat those things, and those things are wonderful, but people also 
um, you know, eat all the things that we make those things out of. So when we're talking about you know reclaiming our food, you know, it's not just seasonal fruits and vegetables. It, it's got to be a, a broader movement that, that that you know incorporates the transformation of food, um, which which largely consists of fermentation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end my my remarks there. And um, and now I'm I'm open to talking about anything y'all want to talk to me. And I was looking for information about uh, fermentation making more micronutrients bioavailable, particularly in the cruciferous family like endol free carbonyl. And do you have you seen any research that says that, that becomes more bioavailable to us in fermentation or not? Um, uh, so the question is about uh, micronutrients in cruciferous vegetables, um, uh, uh, the specific one, in indole 3 I, So um, let me say that, like, no, I don't specifically know about that compound, um, but there, there, there is um, some excellent literature, uh, some of which is cited in, in, in my new book, um, you know, talking specifically about cabbage and other cruciferous vegetables, and um, you know the way that, that that specific micronutrients in them are transformed. Um, and I don't really have a capacity to sort of like hold information that that that's that technical. Um, um, but 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 um, but th that information does exist, and I just don't have it in, in my mind. But if you if you look at my book. Uh, 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 probably in uh, chapter two, uh, the section about health benefits, um, uh, you, you could find reference to uh, sort of a, a really um, a thorough article about different micronutrients uh, found in cruciferous vegetables. Does your book cover the use of bokashi? Um, okay, so so uh, bokashi is a. Uh, um, is a uh, Japanese uh, 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 style of creating compost. And um, I do have a broad survey chapter, the last chapter of the book, which is called um, um, Non-Food Applications of Fermentation. And it includes uh, a pretty broad survey of some you know, different composting techniques. And you know, I devote about a page to Bokashi. Um, uh, but in that page, you, you know, I, I include references to a lot of much more in-depth uh, sources of information. So I am aware of Bokashi. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've met lots of people practicing, and I've heard of some different um, specific techniques that they use. That I tried to sort of, you know, give a general idea of how those techniques work. Um, but I'm certainly not an expert in Bokashi. And let me just say, like, one of the things about, um, you know, sort of learning about the, the, the broad spectrum of different realms of fermentation is that, you know, with the possible exception of sauerkraut, uh, you know, I'm really not an expert in any of them. Um, you know, it's just it's one of one of the things about being a generalist is you know if you learn a little bit about a, a lot of things you don't really know that much about any one of them and, you know because I mean really like the different you know fermentation arts I mean so many people like devote their entire lives to you know sort of learning how to brew beer learning how to bake bread learning how to cure salamis you know learning how to process vast amounts of compost. Um, that you know, like I, I am, you know, I I, I I just know, like you know, teeny, teeny, teeny little bit. But bokashi um, uh, is is kind of an exciting uh, technique. I'm curious, where can a fellow try and find some of these heirloom cultures if they were interested? Okay, so the question is about how do you find heirloom cultures, and I will say that you know up, up until up until a decade or so ago, you pretty much would have had to have had the good luck of you know running into some you know Turkish family or Bulgarian family or or someone who you know had, had brought the cultures over on their migration and had you know had had uh, you know descendants who were who were um, committed to maintaining them. Now, thanks to the magic of the internet, many of them are commercially available. Where I got my uh, yogurt culture, well, where, where I got my first yogurt culture, now, uh, I just, a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, somebody from Maryland sent me um, a Lebanese yogurt culture. So now I, I have, I'm beginning to build a little collection of them. But there's a company on the internet, uh, I just, uh, they're, they're, they're located in South Dakota. Uh, it's called culturesforhealth.com, and they have about a half a dozen different heirloom yogurt cultures um, available. 
Um, surf and fly heirloom cultures, you know, aren't really commercially available. Like tempeh, if you want to make tempeh, you know, all of the tempeh starter that's commercially available in the United States is from sort of a, a, a single strain of Rhizopus oligosporus that a Japanese microbiologist named, named uh, Saito um, uh, isolated. And uh, all the tempeh in the United States is made with this. And, and propagating tempeh is pretty much the most technically demanding uh, 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 you know, fermentation project I've ever done. When I went to Indonesia last year, they use a mixed culture that you know basically they grow it on leaves. They make sandwich with they make a sandwich with these uh, uh, leaves from a tree. Put a few inoculated soybeans on it. Let it sit for three days until it sporulates, and you get two different colors, which indicates that it's a mixed culture. It's not a it's not a pure strain, um, and they're and, and it's absolutely easy. And um, I was able to um, surreptitiously bring a few of them back with me, um, but but I don't believe that it's commercially available anywhere. But 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 certain things like you know. Yogurt cultures, kefir grains, um, you know, are definitely available on, uh, on the internet. Um, yeah, I was wondering, if you took a gallon of raw milk and just set up on a counter, how long would it last? And like, what would be the best, easiest way to do it? Okay, great. So, so the question is about raw milk and just putting it on the on the counter. And if after yeah, two weeks, you could just drink it and be fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we actually have a specific word in the English language for doing that, and it's called clabbering, and the product of it is clabbered milk. And this is a word that you know you find in literature, and increasingly people have no idea specifically what it means. But it's just sort of like you know milk, you know, which nobody ever had to call it raw milk because nobody ever pasteurized milk until the 20th century. But you know, milk that sits out at ambient temperatures and um, uh, it begins to acidify. Uh, and then it will thicken, and that's really clabber, is the stage at which it thickens. If you let it continue to sit out and acidify, what it will do is curdle. And so you'll get a separation of the, of the solids and milk fats floating to the top and the whey underneath it. Um, so, um, you know, the, the thing about clabbered milk is, uh, I mean, you know, it, 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 if you're using the milk of healthy animals and the milk is safe to drink in the first place, then as it sours, you know, a couple of weeks later, it should be fine. I mean, it'll be intensely sour. It might not be that. It might not be that desirable. Um, but but my observation is that uh, you know even in a single environment, you know, where I live in Tennessee, in different seasons and different temperature ranges, the flavor can be very very different. And I like it a lot when I do it in the summertime when the temperatures are warm. But when I do it, in, you know, let's say this time of year where we're not really heating the kitchen and it's, you know, it could be like, you know, 60 degrees, um, I don't like the flavors. It, gets, it develops some more bitter flavors. And so there's, like, there's a huge amount of variability when you work with, uh, you know, wild fermentation, uh, you know, with a substrate like milk. And so, when, you know, around the world, when people when people obtained results that they especially liked the flavor or the texture of, then they would propagate those. They they would perpetuate them, um, uh, usually by a method that's described in the technical literature as backslopping. So, in other words, they would take a little bit of the mature sour milk that they liked and introduce that into the next batch of of, of, of raw milk. Um, so, I mean, I would say it's, it's not a safety issue, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of appeal. I mean, as it gets more and more acidic, you know, actually that really preserves the safety of it. I mean, none of the organisms that people are concerned of the, safe, of the safety of can survive in an acidic environment. So, I mean, acidification is an excellent strategy for safety. Um, if you leave it for a long time, I mean, eventually you'll get ugly molds growing. If you leave the molds growing for a long time, they can deacidify the milk. Um, you know, as the mycelium penetrate, they will affect the flavor of the milk. Um, you know, if you end up with bright color molds growing, they can actually develop some extremely toxic um, compounds. So I don't want to say that, like, you know, your milk three years later is still going to be <laughs> But, you know, as long as we're talking about, you know, modest lengths of time, I mean, really the issue is all about appeal rather than about safety. And, and really, like, when I do it in the summertime in Tennessee, and, and, and it first, uh, and it first uh, um, uh, um, coagulates and, and, and curdles and you get a separation, 
It's exactly like sour cream. I, I should love it at that stage. I recently had a partial quart of hemp milk that was in the refrigerator too long when I went to court and it was very thick. I should have tasted it. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, let me just say one, one thing, which is that, you know, raw, raw, um, raw foods have rich indigenous populations of microorganisms that will ferment things. Foods that have been pasteurized, such as the hemp milk that, you know, you bought sealed in a container, um, you know, in a store somewhere, they are microbial blank slates. I mean, and this is why, you know, milk is a sort of uh, an extreme example because, you know, milk is a high protein microbial blank slate, and it's very rare that you will get, you know, souring organisms dominating in that, in that environment. You typically will get putrefying organisms dominating in that environment, and that's why, you know, we all have such negative associations with, um, you know, milk that goes off in the refrigerator. I mean, it's very different from the sour milk that people have historically um, enjoyed, because, specifically because it's been pasteurized. And so I haven't tried this with hemp milk. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, you know, even with like putrefying milk in your refrigerator, if you taste a little bit of it and that's what clues you into the fact that it's putrefying, you know, it, it's generally not dangerous. Um, it's just generally not appealing, like you want to spit it out. So, you know, if something like that happens with your head milk, um, you know, I think it's okay to be brave and have a little taste and, and, and see if the flavor is, is, uh, is, is nice at all. But generally, if you're working with substrates that have been cooked or pasteurized, um, they ferment best if you introduce some sort of a culture into them. Um, so whether that's kefir grains, water kefir grains, um, uh, sauerkraut juice, uh, sourdough starter, you know, some sort of a, you know, a bacterially dense uh, uh, starter uh, to sort of, you know, guide it so that it doesn't putrefy. Yeah, you briefly touched on the fact that fermentation makes sense if you're practicing agriculture. I was wondering if people had practiced Well, I mean, nobody really knows. So, so the, the question is, is, is uh, you know, I, I had mentioned, uh, you know, the relationship between agriculture and fermentation, but the question is, like, did people practice fermentation before agriculture? And, I mean, we don't, we don't know much about the origins of fermentation at all. Um, I, I mean, you know, there, there, there's, there's actually an enormous amount of uh, speculation in the literature about the origins of fermentation, and, you know, it's like, how did, how did humans discover fermentation? Um, and really, I mean, my, my, own, my, my own thinking about it is that humans never discovered fermentation. I mean, that we knew it before we were humans. I mean, you know, fermentation is a natural phenomenon. You know, fruits that get either damaged or sit on, uh, you know, on the tree or on the bush, uh, you know, past the time when they're ripe, will spontaneously begin to ferment. Uh, lots of different kinds of, uh, you know, animals and uh, insects are, are drawn to the smell and the flavor of fermentation. Uh, you know, I think it's safe for us to assume that our, you know, our, our, our primate ancestors were familiar with the ph phenomenon of, you know, fermenting fruits. And, uh, and there's, even, uh, there, there's even interesting documentation of, you know, different animals uh, becoming disoriented, becoming inebriated, um, um, uh, you know, passing out as a result of working themselves on fermenting fruits. And I think it's reasonable to assume that our primate ancestors, you know, periodically had experiences like that. And what's really the, the uniquely human cultural achievement is that we, you know, figured out how to make that happen on our own terms. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Claude Levi-Strauss, who was a cultural theorist of the 20th century, um, you know, he kind of explored this theme um, um, uh, with, with mead, okay? So, so honey in a hive will not ferment, just like a fully mature honey in a jar is very stable and, and will not ferment. But as soon as it gets diluted with water, it will spontaneously begin to ferment. So, uh, you know, his, his basic, uh, you know, idea is that, um, uh, you know, a, a, a hive gets knocked down in a storm out of a tree. 
gets diluted with water, there's a little puddle on the ground of diluted honey water, and it spontaneously begins to ferment. All honey has yeast in it. Um, and so, you know, he's got this image of like, you know, some, some of our, you know, uh, pre-human hominoid ancestors, you know, sipping some of that. Oh, this, this tastes good. Oh, this feels good. Uh, you know, but, but they couldn't make it happen, so it was just like, you know, maybe once in a lifetime that happens. Maybe it's a few generations before some people stumble upon that. But, you know, at some point, people figured out that they could take, like, a hollowed out part of a tree or something that could hold water. And they could, like, you know, climb up into a tree and, and, and get that hive and pour water over it and make honey water and make that happen. And so, you know, in Claude Levi Strauss's estimation, you know, that is the original act of culture, is, uh, you know, sort of when people figured out how to make that happen. And I think that, you know, many of the technologies that we take for granted, I mean, pottery, I mean, what's the incentive for, you know, figuring out how to make pottery? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, many people think that gourds are the oldest um, uh, cultivated plant. I mean, these are, you know, these are all things that enable, you know, that, that hold liquids and, and that, you know, can serve as vessels for, uh, for, for fermentation. But, uh, you know, of course, hollowed out trees, uh, uh, you know, don't survive for thousands of years. And, um, uh, and neither do gourds. And so, you know, our oldest evidence of fermentation is, comes from pottery. And uh, you know pottery shards that have residue of, of alcohol, and uh, and there's actually this anthropologist at the University of Pennsylvania, Patrick McGovern, who's become an expert at you know sort of analyzing the alcohol residues and figuring out what they were made out of, um, uh, you know, and then kind of reverse engineering some of these uh, you know ancient brews. But we don't know the origins of any of, of any fermentations, and you know really all we can do is speculate. Um, so the question is about cream and why the cream in her refrigerator three months past the expiration date, uh, you know, sort of never soured or, or anything like that. Um, I mean, I have not specifically heard about, um, uh, you know, cream or milk products being irradiated, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen because that, that sort of thing is not generally indicated on labels. But if it was organic, then it should not have been irradiated because that is not permitted under the, under the um, organic um, um, uh, rules. But, but I mean, I will say the cream is much more stable than milk. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, three months seems like an awfully good <coughs> time, but, but, but cream does stay, cream does stay much more stable than, 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 than milk. And what, was, was it closed in the container? Well, the top was closed, but it had been opened in the half of the container. And also, I heard that Costco irradiates Well, I mean, if, if that's it's true, if that's I mean, it's entirely possible that irradiation is taking place, uh, you know, in uh, uh, in contradiction with the rules. Um, I mean, this is just another reason, you know, not to shop at Costco. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good to know where your food comes from, and um, uh, you know, that, I mean, that's one of the I, I think you know um, uh, important logics for supporting the revival of local food is um, you know you know where it comes from, and there is some accountability. Um, but you know, beyond that, I don't think it's it's you know it's not necessarily a problem that your that your milk uh, you know sort of your 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 cream uh, you know stays stays stable for a long time, but but it is a, it, it is it is surprising. Yeah. So, um, I've had a couple questions too. I can a little bit loud. Okay. I've been messing around with uh, lacto fermented vegetables, and I'm wondering what, uh, how necessary is whey for really the high quantities of salt that the recipes call for? And also, I was also doing water paper, and I read that you don't use honey or maple syrup, and so I messed around and just tried it. And it liquefied my keyboard rings. Um, <laughs> and I'm curious why that happened. So. Um, 
Okay, so, so first the question about, about lacto-fermented beverages. Uh, I'm sorry, lacto-fermented lacto vegetables. Yes. Um, so the idea of using whey to ferment vegetables, as far as I can tell, originates with Sally Fallon. And I, I have enormous respect for the work of Sally Fallon and the West City Price Foundation and her book, Nourishing Traditions. But adding whey to ferment vegetables is absolutely redundant and unnecessary. If you have a practice in your life and you're producing a lot of whey from milk, that is a reasonable thing to do with it, but it is absolutely not necessary and it, it comes out of no nourishing tradition that I have uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, the people of China, the people of Korea, the people of Germany, the people of Russia, you know, the, the people of Poland, the people of the parts of the world where this has been, you know, an important survival food, uh, you know, for centuries and centuries do not add way to it. Now, as far as salt, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a farmer, let's say, in the north of Minnesota, okay? If, if the sauerkraut that you're making is the only vegetables that you are likely to have for the next eight months of the year, you actually have an incentive to use a lot of salt. Salt is a preservative in its own right. Um, so a lot of the sort of you know, traditions of making sauerkraut or fermented vegetables more broadly use a lot of salt because this was a survival practice and people learned that you know, salt was associated with effective long-term preservation. But you know, if you are making this food and you don't need to preserve it for you know, eight months um, and you're looking to make something that's going to be delicious to eat and that is going to be supportive of your good health, there is no reason to use uh, a, a huge amount of salt. Most of the small scale uh, commercial manufacturers who I meet are working with somewhere around one and a half percent salt by weight. Um, personally, I don't ever measure the salt. I lightly salt the vegetables, I mix them up with my hands, and then I taste a piece of the vegetables. And then, you know, the way hardly any recipes in the joy of cooking tell you how much salt to use, and they say salt to taste, really the same is true for your sauerkraut. Like, salt it so that it will taste good to you. Um, and understand that the, the salt helps to slow things down. You know, if, uh, you know when, I make, when I make sauerkraut out of the spring cabbage we grow in Tennessee that's ready at the beginning of July when the temperatures are 100 degrees, I'll add a little bit more salt than I do when I make it this time of year when the fall cabbages are ready. And it's, and, and it's going to be in a cellar where the temperatures are cool. So you don't need a lot of salt. And as a matter of fact, you can make sauerkraut with no salt whatsoever. I mean, it won't taste very good, it won't have a very pleasing texture, um, it won't have a very long horizon, but, you know, if you've been told that, you know, you, you know your health will be compromised if you have one more grain of salt, um, you know, you can make it without any salt. I actually think it's a lot better to make it with a tiny bit of salt, you know, a quarter of a percent of salt or something like that will really improve the texture um, and improve the flavor and give it much greater uh, longevity. Um, I actually have made, okay, the other question was about water kefir. Um, water kefir is not the same as kefir. Uh, when you just say kefir, that means the, uh, uh, you know, these, these curds or grains that are used to ferment milk that come from the Caucasus mountains. Um, uh, when people say water kefir, um, uh, that, that generally means a culture that comes from Mexico. Uh, it's called Tipicos. Um, and, uh, you know, Tipicos is actually a very versatile um, uh, uh, culture that, that, that can ferment fruit juices and sugar water flavored with different kinds of fruits. I actually have made water kefir in, um, in honey and had very, very fine results. I haven't specifically uh, uh, made it in, uh, in, in maple syrup. But all of these scopies, I mean, like with, with, um, with kombucha, the conventional wisdom is sugar and tea. Um, and then some people try doing honey and they, and they write to me and they say, my, my kombucha mother shriveled up and sank to the bottom and died. <laughs> Other people write to me and they say, I've been making kombucha for years 
with honey. Other people even say, I don't even use tea. I, I mean, I've heard from a guy who makes it with apple juice. Um, so what I have come to believe is that there are all of these you know, sort of diversions of the family tree. So you could take a group of us and plop us down in some sort of extreme environment that's different from the one that we're used to. And you could sort of like put us all on a, you know, some sort of a monotonous diet of some nutrient different from what we're used to. And chances are, some of us would be very adaptable and resilient and be able to adapt to our new conditions and our new nutrients. And probably others of us would shrivel up and die. Um, and so, you know, we're all, we're all the same species, but, 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 you know, we don't necessarily all have the same adaptability. So that, that's just my, that's, that's the way I've come to think of it, just hearing so many divergent stories. So what I would say for people who are trying to uh, uh, cultivate these and maybe want to experiment, is don't experiment with all of your culture. Like save some of it in the, um, you know, in, in, in whatever kind of medium you were instructed at the beginning to use, and then be experimental with a little bit of it to see whether it is adaptable to the alternative form of nourishment that you're thinking of, uh, of feeding it. All right, there's a few ideas out there about people who are Well, I think it is primarily the la okay. So the question is about sourdough, uh, and uh, maybe it's more broad than that, but 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 specifically it's about sourdough. Do the microorganisms come from the air, or do they come from the the grains that you're using? And I would say mostly they come from the grains, although the, you know the air also influences it, and the air will influence it more if you are in an environment like a bakery where people have been working with it for a long time. Um, so, um, I mean, there's been some really interesting um, experiments with sourdough. This, uh, this, this, this New York State baker, Daniel Leder, who's written a couple of great books about bread. Um, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he took a vacation from his bakery and he went to California, uh, Northern California, San Francisco in particular, is famous for its sourdough. And so he toured around to some Northern California bakeries, and one of the bakers gifted him with some of their sourdough. And he took a portion of it and he sent it to a lab that he works with and had them do a microbial analysis uh, you know, on that sourdough sample. And then he took the rest of it on the plane with him back to New York, and, um, and he, he fed it uh, in his bakery, some of the flour from his bakery, um, and after a couple of feedings, he made some bread with it, but he saved some of it, and then he sent some of the sourdough that he had been feeding his flour in his bakery to, to the same lab. And the microbial composition had completely shifted uh, from, from what he was originally given in California to basically reflect you know, his flour and, and his bakery. So, um, so, yeah, just one more thing about that. Uh, I actually use wine grapes to start my started. Uh, I was wondering if that just provides the beneficial environment for the culture to thrive, or does that actually introduce uh, bacteria? So, okay, now, so his question is about, is that he started his with grapes. And, and sure, I mean, grapes, because they have such dense populations of microorganisms, I mean, all sweet fruits are covered with microorganisms really much more densely than grains are. Um, uh, or, you know, or at least yeast much more densely than, than grains are. So, so it's easier to get your sourdough going faster by introducing um, uh, you know, some, uh, some grapes, or I've heard of people using pineapple juice, I've heard of people using uh, uh, water from cooking potatoes. I mean, there's lots of different techniques, but ultimately it becomes what's on the flour you are feeding it. Um, and if you're in a bakery, then the bakery environment will, 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 will influence it more. Now, now, talk, now, if we shift to talking about beers, um, uh, you know, where, whereas you know, honey water will spontaneously ferment um, you know, based on what's in the honey, if the honey is raw, um, uh, grape juice, apple cider will spontaneously ferment based on what's on the fruits, beers always involve cooking. 
So, I mean, beers are much more complex for, for a number of different reasons. Um, I mean, also grains will spontaneously ferment into acids rather than into alcohol. So beers, you know, you have to do this um, uh, earlier stage, which is converting the starches, uh, 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 complex carbohydrates, into simple sugars, uh, um, which, is what, which is what the significance of malting or germination is. But then also after you brew it, after you cook it, um, then either you need to pitch it with yeast or you have to have some strategy for introducing uh, the yeast. So, you know, what I learned from reading Bill Litzinger's uh, 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 dissertation, who's sitting back here, is that the Tarahumara people who he studied uh, their beer making techniques used their, their vessels, their vessels themselves, which became sort of the, uh, the vehicles of perpetuation of the fermentation organisms. Um, you know, there are traditions in Northern Europe where the, where the brewers would always use the same stick to, to, to stir the beer, and that became the vehicle for, uh, for, for perpetuation. Uh, in the breweries in Belgium, uh, I, I, visit, I visited one of these landing breweries in, um, in, in, in Brussels, and they have traditionally relied upon the air. They don't, they, 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 they don't let a crust build up inside their fermentation vessels. Um, and with the, with the, 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 the place where I visited, they had this huge tank, like you know, half the size of this room, maybe a foot deep, um, in, in their attic. And so every batch of beer, they would empty into this huge tank with a, with a vast surface area. Um, and historically, they, they, they um, expected that their yeast would come from the air. They would only make their beer in the cool months. They wouldn't make it in the summertime because there was too much spoilage in the summertime. And they would rely upon the air. But that was a valley that was full of cherry orchards. And so, you know, the basic idea is that it was in the air because it was dense with cherries. Um, and now the cherry orchards are all gone. So this brewer said that you know he feels like it's just sort of like in a bakery where 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 you know the the accumulation of, of activity just creates a density in the building. You know, this brewer believes that it's in the eaves, that, you know, it's in the rafters and the eaves. Um, and so, you know, the wind basically blows it onto the surface of the beer. And he said he thinks if his building ever burned down, he would never be able to start uh, the same thing in another location because it's just become embodied in the building. But in terms of sourdough, I mean, I really think that the most significant thing is the flour that you feed it, and it will become the, the, the flour that you feed it. Could you say a word about the curing of the olives? Sure, the curing of olives. So first of all, the word curing. Curing covers a lot of ground. You know, any kind of uh, post-harvest maturing of, a, of, of something, uh, not even just the food, is curing. Like right now, my firewood is curing. Um, you know, in the farms around where I live in Tennessee, the, the tobacco is hanging in curing. Um, uh, and uh, some curing involves fermentation. So there's a lot of different techniques for curing olives. You know, some of them involve lye. You know, lye cured olives, that is really a chemical uh, uh, curing of the olives. But some of the methods involve fermentation. Really, the simplest way to cure olives is to put them in a brine. If you want it to go faster, you have to pierce the olives. Uh, if you want the olives to stay crunchier, uh, it takes longer, and you don't pierce the olives. But, but... I have cured them. Okay. Yeah, but first of all, uh, you cure them for about three weeks only in water, and then you put them in uh, some vinegar and salt. Well, I mean, not, not all methods involve vinegar. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's dozens of different methods. Right. I mean, some of them involve pre-soaking in just water. Some involve going directly into a brine. Some involve eventually adding vinegar. That's why we have so many different kinds of, of olives. Is there a fermentation? Yeah, sure. If you put, I mean, if, 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 if instead of vinegar, you put it in salt water, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, olive traditions that involve just, uh, uh, you know, fermenting the olives in a salt water brine. But you know you can't generalize. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that people cure olives, uh, and, and and most you know curing traditions. I mean, the curing of meat also. There's a lot of you know ambiguity ambiguity about what's you know what's really fermented, and uh, you know and, 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 and what is preserved by, by other methods. So basically, salami. Everyone agrees that salami is fermented. The fermentation is critical to uh, the ability of salami to be preserved, and. Um, 
Uh, for the most part in the United States right now, um, salami makers are required to use starter cultures, even though nobody ever used a starter culture for salami until 1961. Um, and in Europe, it's hardly ever uh, done with, with starter cultures. With other kinds of meats, uh, you know, prosciutto, you know, other kinds of ham, um, you know, it, it, it seems like it's, it's mostly the salting and drying that preserves the meat. But in the course of the drying, fermentation occurs. And so the flavor development involves some fermentation, even if the fermentation isn't critical to the preservation of the meat, if that makes any sense. Hey, I've always wanted to know this. What is the story with those 100-year-old eggs? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is the story with those 100-year-old eggs? Um, they're not 100 years old. Um, uh, usually, th those, are, those are cured in an alkaline environment. Usually wood ash, or in some cases, urine. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and it causes the egg to solidify. I think that really it is, you know, primarily a, a, a chemical change rather than a microbial transformation. But they are delicious. I mean, I have tried them a few times. Uh, let's see, someone from that side. Beet kvass. Beet kvass. But I did get my recipe from Sally So, but I don't so, know what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay, first let me just explain what beet kvass is for those of you who haven't heard about beet kvass. Um, well, first let me say what kvass is. Like, if you just hear kvass, um, that, is, that is an iconic food in, uh, in Slavic cultures. And um, kvass is basically dry, old bread re-fermented into a beverage. And it is this sort of like, uh, uh, yellow, um, uh, uh, slightly acidic beverage that, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, my, my family is all from, uh, you know, Russia, Belarus, Poland, and when I first tasted kvass, it was like coming home. I mean, I just like, I love that flavor. I'm really drawn to it, and I've, and I've made quite a bit of it, and I would say three quarters of the people I've served it to have not liked it. <laughs> But one quarter of the people have really, really liked it. Um, but then kvass is so iconic in Russian culture that you know any lightly fermented sour beverage gets called kvass. So the word in Russia for for kombucha translates to tea kvass. Um, and uh, and there 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 is a beverage that Sally Fallon has helped to popularize. Um, that it seems like it really comes from Ukraine, uh, but it's called beet kvass. Sometimes it's also known as beet rasol, rasol being the word for brine. Um, but anyway, beet kvass is incredibly easy to make. You chop up a beet kind of in, in coarse pieces. Like you don't want to grate it because you don't want the sugar to infuse into the water too quickly or because that would cause it to, to essentially go into an alcoholic um, direction. But if you cut it into coarse uh, chunks, then, then the sugar and the color of the beets and the flavor infuses more slowly into the water and it supports an acidic fermentation. I usually put a pinch of salt in. Sally Fallon would say to put a little bit of whey in. I don't usually do that. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the color will infuse slowly into the water. The, the amount of time it'll take depends a little bit on what the proportion of beets to water is. Obviously, it'll happen more quickly if you have more beets to less water. Um, uh, and, 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 and I mostly let the, the, the color be my guide and also the appearance of bubbles on the surface. But what carbonation is, for the most part, is trapped carbon dioxide. So, um, you know, once the color gets dark and you get, an, you get bubbles appearing at the surface, then strain it out and seal it into a bottle. And it is the sealing in the bottle that will make it, um, you know, really uh, effervescent, carbonated. Um, you know, you can get a little bit of carbonation from something that's really vigorously bubbling, even if it's not sealed in a bottle. But to really get a significant carbonation, you need to seal it. But also caution. When you seal any kind of a beverage that still has a significant amount of fermentable sugars in it, 
you are effectively creating a bomb. <laughs> no, and I really, I really, I have heard from dozens of people who have had bottles explode in their homes, some of them in their hands, in their faces. So you really have to be very careful once you seal uh, something that's actively carbonating. And beef kvass isn't sugary enough that it's really going to make a bottle explode. But if you're making, you know, uh, uh, ginger beer, root beer, you know, different kinds of naturally carbonated sodas, there's a huge amount of potential for that. And what I like to do is use recycle soda bottles and do it in soda bottles because what in soda bottles you can feel how carbonated it is becoming. In glass, you have no way of gauging the level of carbonation. Um, so, you know, even if you're trying to avoid plastic, just put one bottle in plastic and it'll just help you gauge the whole batch. And then once it's getting, once you get a lot of resistance, put it into your fermentation slowing device. So that's really how you do it, is you, you have to seal it into a bottle. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, if you put, if you make, if you fill a jar just a quarter of the way, it's almost impossible to get carbonation. Uh, you know, you don't, need, you don't need to fill it all the way, but you know, fill it, fill it most of the way. Um, uh, you know, because uh, um, you know that that's that's the only way to get it to stay in the liquid is if there's nowhere for it to release to. So having a lot of airspace in the jar gives plenty of room for the carbon dioxide that's produced by the fermentation to uh, uh, to go. Um, so yeah, you want you want to always carbonate things in in, in mostly full vessels. We'll always leave a little bit of room, um, but uh, but 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 not you know no, certainly no less than three quarters of the way full. And I don't need wet. You don't need wet. No, it's all. I mean, leave leave the leave the. Um, uh, skin on the beets. I mean, the skin of anything is really where you're going to get the, the your, your, that's the source of your microorganisms. Okay, so yeah, I, I would say like leave the skin on, uh, and I mean, you know, I mean, if you have a, if you have a practice making whey, you can add the whey. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with adding the whey, but you don't need the whey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I generally put like a, just a little pinch of salt. Um, uh, you know. But I don't think it's I don't think the salt is absolutely necessary. I just think the salt helps it have a more balanced flavor. Okay, back there in the center. Is there a reason that um, a homebrew will make you more hungover than like a commercial beer? <laughs> <laughs> is there a reason that a homebrew will make you more hungover than a than a commercial brew? I mean, none 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 that I can think of. Um, I mean, you know, make, is it stronger? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's stronger. Um, you know, once you get into distillation, um, you know, then then there's some some different issues. Um, uh, you know, because you get uh, uh, at the beginning, like the, the 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 first the first stuff that comes off of the still kind of has a concentration of methanol, and so like that'll give you headaches. And if you drink enough concentration of it, it would cause really serious problems. Um, but in the realm of fermented beverages, I, I, can, I can't think of any reason why, why that would be so. How does the introduction of Okay, so the question is, is about, you know, how has the introduction of ferments in my life changed my health, if at all? And it's sort of a hard question because I always have been drawn to the flavor of fermented foods. I mean, I always have loved pickles and sauerkraut um, and yogurt. Um, so, I mean, I sort of, I've, I've always, I've always eaten them. Now, you know, I mean, I've been very open in my, in my writing about the fact that I've been living with HIV for more than 20 years now. And so, I mean, I definitely regard the live culture foods as, you know, sort of a part of um, you know, how I treat myself well to stay healthy. Um, but I also have been on HIV meds since 1999, and, um, and I do, you know, I try to do lots of other things to take good care of myself. So, you know, I, what I, I mean, I try to, 
I mean, my life is definitely not a, um, a like a controlled clinical trial, and I think like most other people's lives are not like controlled clinical trials. And I guess the closest thing I have in my life to a controlled clinical trial is sometimes when I travel, I just find myself in situations where there's no live culture foods for me to eat, and the, you know the main thing that I notice is that my digestion gets sluggish. I get a little bit constipated if that happens to me. Um, but I never go for very long without eating fermented foods. Um, I feel like, in general, my health has been really good. Uh, many of the people who are on the kinds of meds that I'm on have, uh, uh, you know, have, have really uh, difficult digestive challenges that I've never, that I've never had to deal with. Um, and I, I mean, I do have a feeling that the fermented foods are, are part of keeping me healthy, but I'm trying to be really, really careful about, you know, I wrote in the back of wild fermentation, and fer fermented foods have been part of my healing. And out of that, people have extrapolated all sorts of things. Fermentation is a cure for AIDS. Uh, and I, 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 I do not believe that that is the case. And I don't want to promote the idea that, you know, if you're diagnosed with cancer, all you have to do is eat a lot of sauerkraut and it'll go away, even though there are compounds in sauerkraut that are regarded as anti-carcinogenic compounds. Uh, so, I mean, I think, we, you know, we have to think about, you know, these foods as, you know, part of self-care and just keeping ourselves healthy. And, you know, that holds true if you're facing a huge health crisis, you know, if you're living with some sort of chronic condition, if you're feeling the effects of aging, or if you feel like you are the healthiest specimen walking the planet. Um, you know, we, we, we all need self-care, and we all need to do things to keep ourselves healthy. So, I mean, I wish I had a definitive answer for you. So, sauerkraut question. In my family, we always cooked it. Is anything of the good stuff left when you cook it, or is it you need to eat it raw? Okay, so the question is about cooking sauerkraut. And first of all, let me just say that the, you know, sort of the American style of preparing sauerkraut is you ferment it and then you can it. Uh, you, you heat process it. And I think, that, I think that that is a really bad idea. However, I think that you know, the, the culinary traditions that give us sauerkraut, kimchi, even sour pickles, use these things in cooking also. And so, I mean, I love pierogies with sauerkraut. I love Reuben sandwiches with sauerkraut. I love grilled cheese sandwiches with sauerkraut. I love kimchi pancakes. I love kimchi soups. Like, I do not think it is a wrong thing to cook with these as long as you eat some of them raw. Now, as far as the probiotics, I mean, there's kind of an interesting, um, there's a, an interesting issue is arising in the, in, in the world of probiotics because, um, you know, sort of one of the, um, one of the notions of, of, of how, uh, how the sort of bacterial stimulation, uh, uh, you know, actually works is that, you know, the, the fermentation organisms might not actually take up residence inside of our bodies. But because bacteria have this incredible genetic flexibility and can sort of like, you know, take in genes from their environment, it may well be that eating these live culture foods is just enriching the genetic environment available to the bacteria in our gut. And there's some idea that, um, that, that, that even in, uh, you know, food, bacterial foods that have been cooked, um, there may be some ability to resurrect some of that genetic material. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't tell you that it's of no probiotic value to eat cooked things, but it's certainly not uh, of as you know, straightforward of a probiotic value. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a real strong desire to put raw meat in my sauerkraut. Is there any like advice or things that you could speak to about that? Um, I've done a little bit of playing around with that. Um, I mean, you know, certainly, uh, so the question is about raw meat in sauerkraut. Um, so, I mean, you know, certainly in the Asian traditions, uh, uh, you know, frequently fish is, is, is put into uh, uh, kimchi. Um, and, you know, generally the fish is salted first. Um, I've, put, I, I've, I've experimented both with cooked meat sausages in sauerkraut and with raw meat in sauerkraut. Um, and the, the one piece of, of sort of, you know, maybe, maybe safety advice that I was off, would offer is start the sauerkraut first. Let the sauerkraut get acidic. Let, let the vegetables acidify first. And then you're putting the meat into an environment that is already acidic. 
um, a lot of the safety issues with fermenting meat have to do with the lag period before it becomes acidified. And that's why nitrite and nitrate uh, you know, really need to be used for safety in um, salamis and other kinds of uh, fermented meats is because of that lag period uh, before they become acidified. Um, so, uh, I mean, I would say if you want to experiment with, with, with raw meat in, in sauerkraut, um, uh, just, just you know, give the vegetables a few days of fermentation first and then introduce the raw meat. I will say that as a culinary experience, I enjoyed the sausages that had been cooked uh, in the sauerkraut more than I enjoyed the, the raw meat in the sauerkraut. Um, and, uh, and, and, and really, uh, you know, I enjoyed that batch. It was in the middle of the summer for, you know, like a month. And, and, Uh, okay, the very back here. Uh, back to the sauerkraut. If you have some, uh, some lacto fermented sauerkraut that you can, you basically wipe out all the nutrients and the lactobacilli. Can you then open the jar back up, reintroduce a live culture, and then at least get the benefit of the lactobacilli? I guess so. So the, 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 the question is if you could take canned sauerkraut and then reintroduce lactobacillus. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear about this woman from a, from, who, who works at, a, at a, a food pantry where they give away canned food, you know, basically promotes the idea of, of taking a, a live culture way and, and sort of enlivening canned foods by, by, introduce, by culturing them with, with live cultures. I mean, I guess you could do that with sauerkraut, but you're not going to get back the vitamin C right, right. that was already diminished by the application of heat by, by, by doing that. Thanks. Um, so if you buy milk at the store because it's illegal to buy raw milk from most states now, um, is there a way to use your own microbiota, like microorganism population, to ferment that? And if so, how do you know that? your microorganisms will like take over or probably Well, I mean I mean that's what yogurt is. That's what kefir is. Uh, you know, if, so if you if you introduce these communities of organisms into pasteurized milk, um, you know, they, they have a very easy time um, um, you know taking over the milk and, 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 and culturing it. Like you don't really have to worry about it. So uh, you know, when you say your own organisms, like from your mouth, from your mouth, <laughs> that would be highly experimental. <laughs> has 700 different species of microorganisms and you know I don't think there would be any way to like predict um, you know which of them might uh, you know might take over the milk um, so you know that, that, that would be an interesting experiment um, so yeah I mean let, let me just say like you know every possible Variation of fermentation has not been tried. It's possible that you know out of your saliva would come the next big global fermentation. <laughs> but, but I'm a little bit dubious. Okay, very bad. Um, so if you have like an excess of raw goat milk and no refrigeration, what would be like? I guess from your experience of traveling. What was like the most common way to like, preserve that or to like, utilize that milk after it's curdling? Well, I mean, okay. So if you have an excess of milk, the best thing you can do with it is turn it into cheese. I mean, that, I mean, that's what that's what that's what people all around. I mean, that's what gives rise to all the cheese traditions around the world, and that's why cheese shops are filled with all of these like crazy different variations of cheese because everywhere in the world where people domesticated animals during certain seasons, they had more of it than they knew what to do with, and they would preserve it for the period when they would dry up their animals, and and that's cheese. So, I mean, I would say make cheese. Yeah. You could also just leave it out to clabber and you know call it sour cream, but that will never be as stable or last for as long as a sort of you know denser, drier cheese will be. So it would be the simplest way to make cheese without going to the grocery store, like um, without adding any different like bacteria. That you 
Well, I actually, I mean, just uh, a couple weeks ago, I went to the uh, Southeast Artisan Cheese Festival in Nashville, and uh, and these people had this sort of like spontaneous lactic fermentation cheese that they just let it clabber and curdle, and then they basically strained that out through a very fine cloth and let it drip. Yeah. So they started with clabbering, and then they and then then by hanging it, you know, basically in a in a, in a, in a, in a fine woven cotton cloth, you just get you get more whey to drip out of it. The, the 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 more water you can remove, the more stable it will become. But you can get the initial curdling to happen by spontaneous acidification. Now, I mean, the flavor of it in a given environment, given temperature, you know, may or may not be pleasing to you. It might end up being more pleasing to you if you started with kefir or yogurt or some other kind of a milk culture. But, but certainly, I, I think you should feel uh, uh, empowered to experiment and, and then sort of see That's whether the flavor was pleasing. And then behind you, there was another question. Yes, Sandor, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Um, you're most welcome speaker and guest. I'd like to ask, can you give me any advice when you make NATO? Natto? Natto. Okay, so natto is the Japanese soy ferment that has never become very popular in the United States. Like, you know, all the other Japanese soy ferments have kind of, you know, gained at least some, some amount of popularity. Um, uh, natto, I mean, I would say the two reasons why, why natto has not become very popular is, popular is one, um, uh, uh, the fermentation uh, 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 yields this coating on the beans which is slimy and mucilaginous. Uh, and number two, it is an alkaline fermentation that ends up smelling a little bit like ammonia. So, you know, two things that your typical Western palate is a little bit put off by. That said, I love natto, and, um, and, um, and, and also, I mean, really every vitamin supplement store in North America right now has a, has a, um, a supplement called natto kinase, which is, you know, one of these, um, um, uh, you know, metabolic byproducts of fermentation, which has been recognized as, um, as, as, as very uh, 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 helpful medicinal compound. And so uh, uh, it's been found to dissolve fiber accumulations in blood vessels, uh, which is actually you know, very, very useful uh, uh, you know, to, to, to people in our culture and also to help regulate blood clotting. So people who are at risk for aneurysms and other kinds of clotting disorders are taken. But that said, natto is incredibly easy to make. I mean, first of all, you could buy a starter. Uh, uh, my friends at Gem Cultures import a starter, natto moto, from, uh, from Japan, and you know, uh, you can buy a small amount of it for like $15, and for $35, you can buy enough to, to culture 100 pounds of soybeans. Um, however, Bacillus subtilis is found on all beans, and, um, and when it's stressed by heat, when you cook the beans, it, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, it generates these, these spores that can survive 250 degrees. So unless you pressure cook your beans, if you just boil your beans, even if you boil them for you know six hours until your soybeans are nice and soft, which is what you want to do if you want to make natto, um, you can just cool it off and then incubate it. Keep it at, at an elevated temperature, a little bit above body temperature, 100 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, keep it from drying out. I do it in a Pyrex baking dish with some wax paper over the top and chopsticks to hold the wax paper down at the edges. Um, and after about you know, 12 hours, it's not natto. Um, and also, you know, natto, natto uh, is eaten in Japan. A few other uh, East Asian uh, uh, cultures uh, have natto-like uh, uh, foods. But also, all across West Africa, people eat uh, seed-based condiments. Uh, the one that I know the name of uh, is the Yoruba name, Dawa Dawa, but there's, there's dozens of different names and they make it from lots of different uh, uh, seeds from different kinds of trees and, and bushes, but then it, it's, a, it's the same bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, as is used to make natto. They don't do any culturing of it in the West African uh, example. It just it survives cooking. And, uh, and then what they do is they, um, uh, they dry it and make powdered condiments that they add 
uh, you know, they had very you know, small amounts of its food, and it's this real sort of like, if you use a small amount of it, it's this, this real kind of, you know, subtle, uh, you know, flavor complexity uh, uh, in the food that's really quite lovely. Okay, last question. I'm sad to say, I'm just looking where you're all excited. Like, free food and drink, so. Okay, yellow shirt. <laughs> So I, a couple years ago, I heard a rumor that you were experimenting with hanging meat to preserve it, but without like, salting or smoking or doing anything like that. And I'm wondering if that's true, and if it's true, if you'd be willing to talk about your results. No. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I am... I'm an, I, I mean, I'm an experimentalist, but I mean, I'm not. I'm not really up for doing just random things. <laughs> um, and no, no, no. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've done. I mean, I've made some salamis. I've made some prosciutto type things, but I use salt. Uh, and when I've made salamis, I use nitrite and nitrate. And um, you know, I, I, I mean, I really, especially the realm of meat, I've, I've really stayed doing very uh, conventional things. And I don't know, you know, I, I, what the, the, the profile of me that was in the New Yorker, they had a scene where, you know, appear, there, there are these people who follow this diet called the Primal Diet, uh, which is, you know, sort of this weird theoretical thing that this guy, Ajinus von der um, uh, you know, sort of thought up, and, and um, you know, they eat this thing that they call high meat, and they just sort of, they cut up cubes of meat, and they put it in jars, and leave it in the refrigerator for months, and then, um, you know, they take it outside the house, and they go like this, and they pop it in to air it out, uh, and they put it back in their fridge. And when I meet those people, they always want me to try their meat. And, you know, they always tell me, like, oh, it doesn't taste good. It's not about the taste. It's like, it's, you believe, Ajinist, that it's good for you. Um, so I'm just not, like, you know, I love...